Hello and welcome to this DW Business Special. I'm Chris Kober in Berlin. Russia quits a vital grain shipping agreement with Ukraine. What does that mean for food security and Ukraine's revenues? How is the Ukrainian economy faring more than 500 days into Russia's full-scale attack? And are foreign companies willing to pour money into a country at war? These are some of the questions we'll be discussing today. And I'm happy to be joined by Natalia Shapoval. She is the president of the Kiev School of Economics Institute and vice president for policy research. Welcome, uh, Natalia. Let's dive right in here. Uh, serious concerns about food security are growing again after Russia ended a grain export deal it had with Ukraine. What does that mean for Ukraine? It means two things. First, that uh, government will have to search for ways uh, for, to export grain instead, uh, uh, despite uh, uh, Russia's behavior. And second, there, there are risks to these exports. It uh, eventually will be lower than previous year. Hmm. All right, let's take a moment to look at the context here for our discussion. Because experts say the grain deal helped stave off a worsening of global hunger and prevented a surge in food prices around the globe. It allowed Ukraine to export grain and other food items via its ports despite Russian warships in the Black Sea. 45 countries received grain shipments from Ukraine under the initiative. Asia saw 46% of the imports, while 40% went to Western Europe, 12% went to Africa, and 1% went to Eastern Europe. But Russian President Vladimir Putin was unhappy with the agreement, saying part of it that would have eased similar exports from his country has not been satisfied. After Russia scuppered the deal, Germany said it'll support Ukraine to find alternative paths to export grain. In a tweet, German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock suggested the European Union solidarity lanes by barge, rail or road as an alternative. Via this initiative, the EU has vowed to continue bringing food out of Ukraine on to global markets. Now, back to you, Natalia. Would that work for Ukraine, getting grain out of the country on other routes than by ship? Uh, it would partially work, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, volume of the alternative routes is uh, growing with new construction projects. However, it cannot replace fully uh, the uh, routes through the sea and through the Danube River, for example. Mm. So it will be lower and it will be more expensive. And unfortunately, there is still a problem with Poland and Hungary who don't support mm. these uh, exports their countries. Let's talk about uh, these, these other European countries here in a second. Um, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says he wants to continue the shipments via the Black Sea, despite the Kremlin saying, well, that will be risky. Uh, what do you make of this determination? Uh, I mean that uh, basically Ukraine will have to ship and uh, partners like Turkey, UN going to need to support and partners uh, in the West going to have to provide some kind of uh, uh, weapon, maybe hmm. uh, flight jets, etc. to secure the shipment. Because representatives of the World Food Program are saying, well, uh, which shipping companies are willing to take such a risk? Which insurance companies uh, are willing to ensure a cargo that is passing through a war zone, right? Yes, that's exactly the case. And yeah, just for human, it's risky. So uh, it will need mm. like security military kind of protection. Now, you mentioned uh, an issue that Ukraine has on this topic with, uh, with other European countries because neighboring markets could remain difficult, uh, a difficult terrain for Ukraine. A number of European countries want a ban on Ukrainian grain imports to be extended because they say inflows of Ukrainian grain have hurt domestic farmers. Uh, what do you make of that against the backdrop of uh, the huge wave of solidarity uh, that Ukraine has received from countries like uh, Poland, for example? 
eventually, even with this difficult uh, routes of export, Ukrainian grain and agri products in general might be more cheap and they might settle on these uh, markets, as we see has been happening. Uh, although uh, the primary goal of the export is actually to go through these countries to other er uh, to other markets. So mm -hmm. if there is a way to ensure this, I think uh, it's possible to find agreement with uh, Poland and Hungary. But Ukrainian agri sector is quite strong. We have big agri holdings that are very productive and uh, price competitive as compared compared to many European countries who kind of preserve smaller, you know, farmers and for whom it uh, might be more uh, expensive to produce. Natalia, tell us again, how important is it that Ukraine can sell wheat, barley uh, and other grains? Uh, it's super important for the world because of the food security issue and because uh, uh, there are millions of people uh, who get food because of Ukraine. Uh, and for Ukraine, it's super critical. It's 60% of our uh, export revenue. So we depend in terms of foreign currency, macroeconomic situation, and uh, our big agri sector like farmers depend on this. So uh, any you know significant deviation in export volumes will uh, dramatically hit the uh, uh, economy faster uh, than it has been done last year. So being able to export uh, grain is important uh, for the Ukrainian economy. Let's take a look at how it is faring under these distressing circumstances. Russia's war in Ukraine has damaged the economy. Uh, there was a 29% fall in Ukraine's GDP last year. But in fact, the International Monetary Fund expects a stronger recovery as the economy progressively adapts to war conditions. The IMF last month upgraded real GDP growth for 2023 to a range of 1% to 3% from the previous range of minus 3 to plus 1%, although it said the outlook remains highly uncertain as the war continues, of course. Um, back to you, uh, Natalia. Um, can you give us an overview of Ukraine's economy right now? What is the state of it? And has the situation stabilized since the early days of the war? So the situation has uh, stabilized and the uh, macrofinancial situation is uh, quite healthy. Uh, yes, Ukraine uh, lost uh, one third of the GDP and approximately one third of the labor market to different reasons uh, for mobilization and people leaving the country and destruction of certain enterprises. Uh, around, like more than 100 big enterprises, industrial enterprises were destroyed. So we lost a big chunk of our our metallurgy, which was also, you know, one of the drivers of the export and economy in general. Mm. Um, however, business activity is reviving. The ongoing recovery also contributes to it and hopefully will contribute further. Uh, for example, this year, the plans for this immediate recovery going to be between uh, one and three billion dollars, uh, depending on the like speed of right. the execution of these projects. But uh, like helping these deoccupied regions, energy sector mm. comes as a kind of investment for the economy, which improved the situation. Now, as you mentioned, uh, there is obviously destruction uh, within Ukraine in, in this time of war. There uh, is also a shortage of workers because uh, people have to go and fight. So where is this growth coming from currently that's stabilizing the economy? Uh, small and medium uh, enterprises are drivers. A lot of businesses are working for the military uh, sectors uh, and also uh, the construction uh, and uh, IT services uh, that they all basically uh, revive. Uh, so basically uh, across the whole economy uh, especially in less capital intensive uh, businesses uh, 
you know, everyone tries to survive mm. uh, and uh, tries to get back to the economic activity. You are right that there is a big mismatch on the market. Some uh, businesses, they are like thirsty for the workers because many were mobilized or left uh, for other countries. Uh, and in other uh, sectors, uh, we would see uh, huge uh, unemployment. This is a big structural uh, problem for the economy going further. Hmm. Uh, can you give us an idea of uh, what the situation uh, in, in, in people's lives is like? I mean, can you go and buy all the kind of food you want in supermarkets, for example? The situation is very different in different parts of Ukraine. So if you go uh, closer to uh, occupied or recently deoccupied territories of Ukraine on the east and south, uh, then uh, it's very doomed. Like Kharkiv was deoccupied, uh, uh, Kherson, uh, some parts of uh, uh, Mykolaiv were uh, under big shelling and now they are reviving. So there, there is still a lot of shelling, a lot of of uh, strikes from Russia. Russians are very close to these territories, so air defense is not helping too much. And it actually led for most people and businesses to leave these territories. Uh, and uh, no investment, very little business activity is going on. This is a huge problem. Uh, they have food supplies. It's not uh, an issue uh, anywhere, basically, because of the humanitarian lines and be because mm. like, it's a big you know, sector in Ukraine. Uh, if you go to Kyiv, for Western and Ukraine, it's uh, it's absolutely okay. And is, is this sort of situation is is this the same as it in, has been since the early days of the war, or has there been any change uh, in the meantime? There is uh, a change, like in the early days of the war, especially when uh, Kyiv was under uh, attack and when we didn't have a good quality air defense, uh, the business activity was lower and uh, uh, in general it was uh, more difficult uh, to protect uh, the assets and businesses were reluctant to work. Uh, right now with uh, Patriots with all kind of uh, defense uh, and weapons coming to Ukraine in uh, places like uh, Kiev and Western Ukraine. It's much, much more uh, safer because uh, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, uh, shahids and rockets that Russians are sending to us might be captured, which is good for people and business too. All right, so much for the status quo. Um, let's take a look ahead. Rebuilding Ukraine after the war is said to be a mammoth task. The World Bank estimated in March that the cost of rebuilding the country one year on from the start of the war amounted to $411 billion, a huge figure that is set to increase as the conflict drags on. Ukraine faces an enormous fundraising challenge and is one that governments and development finance institutions won't be able to meet without help from private investors. Now, on that note, last month, over 400 global companies pledged support for rebuilding the war-torn economy at the Ukraine Recovery Conference in London. They included blue chips like Citi, Sanofi, Virgin and Philips. They say they intend to boost investment in the country. Let's go back to my guest, uh, Natalia Shapoval, uh, president of the Kiev School of Economics Institute. Um, Natalia. Uh, give us an idea. Are foreign investors active in Ukraine right now at this time of war or is it all aid money that's flowing in? It's uh, mostly uh, aid money and uh, taxpayers money. Uh, however, there are some activities here and there. For example, uh, in energy sector, I just, uh, you know, just were walking on the street uh, and uh, uh, in the Western Ukraine, and uh, I've seen a new uh, wind uh, plants, uh, wind energy plants. So some activity, investment activity is going on where it's uh, more safe kind of uh, business uh, to do and on more safer territories. However, big kind of investments are not coming. Uh, unfortunately, the instruments for uh, insurance of uh, war risks that were launched by the World Bank and MIGA, they didn't uh, work out as intended, so they are not mm. utilized to full extent. And this is still a question how to spur this investment. And uh, I just want to make one 
correction, like what is super critical for the recovery funding of Ukraine, these are reparations and compensations f from Russians, uh, mm. because this kind of damage uh, cannot be, I think, and it's not fair to put it on the Western uh, countries. It's fair to put it uh, on Russia. And these numbers will include not only restoration of the damages that we estimate, the World Bank estimates, UNDP, mm. everyone estimates, but then no one estimates the damages to human capital and uh, uh, the losses of lives of people in Russia will must uh, pay this to you know get back to secure more secure and uh, international law based right. uh, world uh, after this. Natalia, that's something obviously that, that, that Russia is heavily opposing and which is uh, which is still uh, being debated right now. In the meantime, many activists are saying that reconstruction of Ukraine and its economy cannot wait until the end of the war, which is nowhere in sight, to be honest. And reconstruction has begun, even as shelling of Odessa, as we've seen in the recent days, uh, continues. Is this a policy you think that is right? It's absolutely right uh, policy and uh, example on the occupied territories of Ukraine, for example, like villages near front line in Kherson, like village Pasad Pokrovsky, for example, there are many like this, but it was fully destroyed. There are more than 900 uh, houses and almost each of them is destroyed and people mm. still have to live there. More than 400 people got back to live there. And there is no way that government leaves them without water, utilities, without basic shelter. So there is basically it's an option. It's option doesn't exist not to recover. Private investors see a, quote, tremendous opportunity to invest in Ukraine's post-war future. That's according to JP Morgan's head of debt capital markets for Central and Eastern Europe. What needs to happen for this opportunity to become reality, other than the war needing to end? Yeah, so I think uh, the ideal answer is NATO membership and something like boots on the ground, which will really provide uh, insurance in security. The more kind of uh, middle way answer is that uh, there should be a proper uh, war insurance. And uh, I believe many businesses can start uh, investing in uh, this case. For example, in the energy sector, it's quite a distributed kind of capital. And like with wind or solar, there is a lot can be done in the West or Central uh, Ukraine, or sometimes even in the East, even as the war going on. So you say there must be a military protection before there can be private investments. Military protection or, as middle scenario, a proper uh, insurance of the war risks. Hmm. Uh, Natalia, before the war, uh, public assets constituted the largest segment of wealth in Ukraine and were seen as plagued by inefficiency, corruption and fraud. Now, experts say that restructuring the management of public assets will serve as a gateway to broader investment in the country. How far along are these efforts? Uh, over the last 10 years, the situation changed drastically. Uh, for example, we, de we did a huge bank sector uh, reform and closed half of uh, all the banks that were basically captured by the financial groups, also corrupting on those public assets that you are saying. Uh, then uh, public procurement reform, reforms of the corporate governments of the state-owned enterprise, reforms uh, of the sales and rent of the public assets. So a uh, huge effort has been done. Uh, and uh, I think Ukraine is on the very right way uh, in these reforms. Uh, going further, it's uh, important to further privatize uh, the some of the public assets and just continue those reforms, improving corporate uh, governments, management of those enterprises. Now it's quite difficult because uh, many of the public assets are in energy sector, for example, mm. and Russia specifically targeted it. So, you know, there is no way to privatize a huge uh, 
uh, deficit uh, of these companies right now. And uh, of course, it's uh, like a huge, uh, uh, you know, part of the Ukrainian overall mm. financial situation that uh, this energy sector right now suffers uh, like billions of uh, in damage. As you look uh, at the Ukrainian economy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the rest of the world, um, what do you hope for? What do you wish for going forward as an, as an economist and as somebody who's a citizen of Ukraine? Um. As, econo as an economist, I would say Ukraine has a solution to the green transition because we have relatively big territory. We have uh, good uh, uh, raw materials like metallurgy. Uh, so Ukraine has potential to provide cheaper and greener steel, hydrogen, energy, electricity, uh, and uh, it would be like more effective to Europe even to buy it here and uh, than to create it hmm. in their territory. Uh, so I think uh, Ukraine has a lot of solution here, also with agri and food. Uh, Ukraine is a huge provider and sol contribution to solve this global uh, problem and also a platform to create, again, uh, greener, more environmentally friendly crops. As a citizen, I think that Ukraine and this case uh, of for you know for the Western countries, for all democratic companies uh, countries, uh, it's an important case uh, for security uh, and for uh, maintenance of international law and compensations for the future. If uh, we manage to do it uh, properly, so that people that the international law is restored, those who are guilty punished and those who suffered get compensation, then this uh, will be a huge benefit for all countries, uh, not only in, in Europe, but in Africa, Middle East, who suffered the same problems mm. and the world didn't pay enough attention to it. Those are the thoughts of Natalia Shapoval. She's the president of the Kiev School of Economics Institute and vice president for policy research. Thank you so much for your time, Natalia. And thanks Thank to all of you for watching. Be sure to tell us what you think in the comment section. We'll see you next time. Take care.